live. Okay, so hi, my name is Sebastian Budden. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you will already be familiar with. So I want to just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference. And we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institution, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you also probably be familiar with. It's published by Brill Academic Press, and then all the volumes come out 12 months later with Haymarket Books in Chicago, paperbacks. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now of translations of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, ch uh, China to um, India to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaping up in the book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature and in, in making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on this scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. And also, of course, if, again, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conferences, the journal and the book series. And we think it would be uh, well, we think it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive for those to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books in the book series, publicize both around you, and help us build historical materials and projects. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. And I would like to welcome you to another of the ses another session of HM21 online. My name is Panagiotis Sotiris, and I am a member of the editorial board of historical materialism. And tonight's panel is entitled Cultural Resistance Under Post-Human Capitalism, a Locust Review Imago Panel, uh, which is indeed organized by the Locust uh, Arts and Letters Collective, three members of which are present here tonight with us. Uh, Adam Turl, a writer and artist, and a member of the collective, Tis Turn, also writer and artist, and Alexander Billet, a writer, radio producer, and also holds rights for a review such as Jacobin. And uh, they, the Locust Arts and Letters Collective is responsible for the Locust Re Review, which, whose website you can visit and also uh, learn about their particular uh, aesthetic strategy, what they call the critical realism against capitalist realism. And since they like to combine theory, practice, artistic practice, and also theory, you should also check uh, Imago, which is the, let's say, theoretical arm 
of the uh, Locust uh, project. Before I give the speech, and although you already heard it from Sebastian Bajent's avatar at the beginning of this session, uh, please, uh, although this, this conference is offered without any registration fee whatsoever, please uh, donate through the Eventbrite uh, webpage, which we use for its, to register for its event. Uh, the, the historical materials project depends also on the on whatever income is generated at conferences. This helps us expand our project. Also, please uh, subscribe to the journal because you will have the opportunity to have like four of these uh, volumes each uh, year, about a thousand pages of uh, cutting edge Marxist theory. Uh, every year at something less than 60 euros if you take advantage of the 25% discount. And also, uh, if you're associated with an institution, get the institution to also have an institutional access uh, subscription. And of course, check out the book series, uh, which is becoming one of the most important projects of publishing uh, Marxist theory uh in various directions uh in the past years more than 230 35 uh, volumes already out and around 30 35 volumes each year uh which they appear once they appear one year after their appearance with brill which they might be rather expensive books but they're books for libraries one year afterwards they came out they come out as uh, hay market paperbacks, really affordable, and there is a 40% uh, discount on hay market publications through, uh, throughout the duration of this, uh, of this conference. And of course, I take the opportunity to also thank hay market because hay market are providing us with technical uh, support during this, uh, during this conference. Without further ado, I, I give the floor to, uh, to Adam. Uh, its, uh, its presenter will have around 20 minutes. Let's keep it to that limit so that we have at least half an hour of discussion. Uh, now, uh, in regards to our viewers, uh, since this is uh, streamed through uh, a, the YouTube, a YouTube channel, please uh, use the YouTube chat uh, uh, to pose comments and questions, and we will relay them to uh, the presenters and they will respond to them. So, Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yes, okay. Um, so real quick announcement before I get into my presentation, just a little bit more about Locust Hearts and Letters Collective. We formed the collective in late 2019. It now includes comrades in Texas, Los Angeles, Southern Illinois, upstate New York, West Bengal, India, Florida, and Washington, D.C. Um, initially formed, uh, as we said, to produce this quarterly critical and realist art and literature journal, Locust Review. We're now working on issue seven, which will be coming out very early next year. <clears throat> We've also added to our project a theory uh, annual, which is also a periodic nonfiction website, Imago, uh, more or less monthly podcast, Locust Radio, and a periodic audio play series, Swarm Stories. And we're starting to plan for an things like in real life art exhibitions and so on sometime in the next year. So if you want to find out more about our project, be a part of our project, go to our website, locustreview.com. You can find out how to subscribe or submit work um, on the site. So, all right, onward to Brechtian cybernetics. So in terms of subjectivity um, and digital media, body augmentation, surveillance, the lines between machine and human subjects seem to be increasingly blurred. The subject appears to be bifurcated between a digital and analog being, each shaped in different but related ways by capitalism. And this bifurcation of the cybernetic raises the question of a Brechtian cybernetics, the use, exposure, and alternation between digital and analog to help enable criticality, right? So as the cybernetic, cybernetic came into greater focus in the 1970s and 1980s as a trend, 
there were, among many other, two key left and post-left responses. There was an understandable and fear and antipathy, a seeming displacement of the human threatened partial autonomies and authenticities connected to the threat of things like labor automation. This was sometimes presented in a questionably gendered imagery and terms. A misogynistic understanding of the subjective and hysteria about male penetration responded to a legitimate fear with a sexist framework. As Mark Fisher notes in David Cronenberg's 1983 film Videodrome, the main character Max Wren grows a tumor that causes televisual hallucinations. Max's, Max's cybernetic alteration means he has not extended, and this is a quote, but literally invaginated. Conversely, given that subjectivity at the time and, and continually is often and was presented in an essentialist manner, many queer and feminist writers embraced the cybernetics potential for easing subjective fluidity. One of the most famous arguments along these lines was Donna Haraway's 1985 Cyborg Manifesto. And of course, while the, this potential for the cybernetic was real, this perspective sometimes downplayed the extent to which the cybernetic would be shaped by capital. And I think this was a missed encounter. The problem with the cybernetic flow as it was developing was primarily about self-determination, consent, and control. As Jody Dean argues um, in her 2003 article, Why the Net is Not a Public Sphere, the internet is structured by an ideology of publicity and the surface of communicative capitalism. For Dean, the contradiction of participation is central. She writes, precisely those technologies that materialize a promise of full political access and inclusion drive an economic formation whose brutalities render democracy worthless for the majority of people. As Dean observes in Democracy and Other Neoliberal Fantasies, despite a large counter mass media in opposition to the invasion of Iraq in 2003 by the United States, this had absolutely no influence on actual policy. As the masses are lifted into the digital heavens, Dean writes, their communications become mere contributions to the circulation of images, opinion, and information, to the billions of nuggets of information and affect trying to catch and hold attention. And this is part of the process by which the value of the use value of communications gives way to exchange value. Now, bourgeois ideology is literally coded into social media and other digital platforms. As Walter Benjamin famously argues, fascism sees its salvation in granting expression to the masses, but on no account giving them rights. While social media is not necessarily itself fascist, it is at its core expression without rights. The people who most shaped digital communicative capitalism took the libertarian impulses of the new left, excised its egalitarianism, its socialist new communist trends, and fused those libertarian impulses with both messianic feeling and the neoliberal turn. Apple Computer, Dean notes, encapsulated this in this advertisement from 1984. It's about time a capitalist started a revolution. Dean acknowledges that the internet sometimes enables struggle, but the duration of these movements, their organizational resilience and operational solidarity has often been ephemeral. If the internet seems to falter for the left, it enables the far right. This is partly because the logic of the internet echoes the logic of fascism as noted, expression without rights. Richard Barbrook and Andy Cameron in their 1995 essay, The Californian Ideology, situate the ideological origins of Silicon Valley at the intersection of Bay Area counterculture and the neoliberal turn, a fusion of technological determinism and libertarian individualism among a highly skilled and contracted labor aristocracy. Layers of this group came to believe they created cyberspace from individual genius, forgetting its origins and massive government subsidies and the DIY ethos of its earliest programmers. They embraced Jeffersonian ideals of petty bourgeois democracy, which have also eventually led to some of its more overtly anti-democratic ideologies today. Barbara and Cameron argue the Silicon Valley idealized world that, uh, that Silicon Valley came to idealize a world of cyborg masters and robot slaves in which human labor is minimized and power rests with the cybernetic labor aristocracy. But capitalism being capitalism, human labor remained central. Barbara and Cameron Wright, reflecting on Thomas Jefferson, at his estate at Monticello, Jefferson invented many clever gadgets for his house, 
such as a dumbwaiter to deliver food from the kitchen into the dining room. By mediating his contacts with his slaves through technology, this revolutionary individualist spared himself from facing the reality of his dependence on the forced labor of his fellow human beings. In the late 20th century, technology is once again being used to reinforce the difference between the masters and the slaves, they write. This democratic ideal, therefore, prefigures the post-human, hyper-Cartesian, and even the dark Enlightenment ideas that would later percolate in Silicon Valley, or at least its darker corners. While tech neo-reactionaries are anti-populist, they share with the proto-fascist hostility to the so-called cathedral, a term initially used by cyber utopians to describe the ideological apparatus of modernity, higher education, the press and mass media, counterposing it to a supposedly open and democratic bazaar. But the petty bourgeois character of that bazaar concentrated power over time, as it does in capitalism, is no longer an anarchic market, but something more like a monetized counter cathedral predisposed to erratic right wing populisms. Consider the key contradiction on the question of democracy from a pragmatic coding position within the logic of uh, community capitalism. People say they want X, but we know from our data they want Y. People say they want informative and thoughtful texts and beautiful and sublime images. We know, however, they click on banality, celebrity, trauma, porn, racism, sexism, and fascism. As Jen Shrey outlines in The Revolution That Wasn't, her intensive study of right and left social media practice in North Carolina, conservatives had had a much greater success online than civil rights and labor organizers. Shrey argues that there are three interrelated reasons for this. One, social class two organizational resources, and three ideological differences. While most working class people in the United States are now online, access is inconsistent for poor and working class people, and successful digital interventions and propaganda actually does take resource and organization. Freddy observes key labor and community organizations on the left were consistently outgunned in terms of digital propaganda by right-wing organizations throughout the 2010s. In terms of ideology, the rights approach dovetailed with the structure of social media to a far greater degree. Civil rights and labor organizations often aim to activate and incorporate people into self-conscious activity. In contrast, she found that right-wing organizations were largely focused on a sort of good news proselytizing. From their point of view, good news, not from our point of view. Moreover, in the US South, left civil rights and labor organizations had far more to worry about in terms of retaliation from racists and the state. So the digital code is actually determined by bourgeois ideology as noted by authors like Jesse Daniels. This code is also racist, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally racist. Ruha Benjamin refers to this, re referencing Michelle Alexander as a new Jim code. And in addition to the unintentional racism, there's a great deal of intentional racism as well as with NTech Labs ethnicity recognition software that's under development. It might have been fully developed by now. It was under development when I was researching it. Jesse Daniels discusses the structural enabling of racist ideological formations on social media. And this is similar to the observations of mainstream terrorism experts like Sofia Moskalenko and Clark Hawley, that the participatory ARG aspect of QAnon turns social media into collective myth-making platforms for the far right. As a recent New York Post lamentation goes, Generation Z is made of zombies, and they argue this partly because they have an obsession with technology that is to blame. The trope follows that young people's interfacing with screens is the culprit for depression. It is, of course, not considered that the depression can be the result of nonstop social trauma for the past 20 some years. Now, while this is absurd, at the same time, our cybernetic lives are contradictory. We do not can truly control the machines that are increasingly part of our subjective ex existence. In Locus 6, we ask, what if we become cyborgs right before the world ends? And because we are cyborgs, we can no longer fear the apocalypse. What if the addictive aspects of social media distort or prevent the formation of really truly free subjectivities, including the class conscious subjectivity needed for proletarian revolution? Does the glowing sky on fire become, we wrote, in our minds, an Instagram filter. We also responded in Locust uh, 6 with a counter imaginary. What if having become part machine, class consciousness demands we figure out how to be in solidarity with that part of us that is machine? What if the machines, 
Being dead labor, the products of previous generations of labor in an animist sense are our working class ancestors. Now the cybernetic can obviously be liberating and has been, but the cybernetic is also the latest iteration of the machine that alienates the individual as described by Marx. If the cybernetic blurs our subjectivity with dead labor, it is inherently Gothic. And under our control, this could be something like the beginning of the cosmic stream of thinking about things like conquering death, but it's not under our control. The relation of dead and living labor has always been central to capitalism and Marx's analysis of capitalism. But as Mark Fisher notes in Flatline Constructs, this tended to be experienced in a different way by the modern slash industrial individual. The paper was bound to the machine, but also separate from it. Fisher, borrowing from Frederick Jameson, imagines how Blade Runner's androids might react to the Edvard Munch painting, The Scream, from the late 1800s. In Munch's painting, subjectivity is represented by a sorry, by a figure uh, sort of under assault by their environment. The android is assumed lacks this assaulted uniqueness. The horror instead is that it's not unique. It is just one more Rick or Morty in a multiverse of infinite Rick or Mortys. This echoes, echoes how capitalist ideology shapes the social networks, conditioning us for disposability and interchangeability in the precarious labor market. In terms of art, the contradiction of reproducibility and aura uh, as Benjamin described, the cult value of the unique or past art object or gesture, aesthetic value created by distance and space and time is accelerated. The constant churning of images and text obliterates the value of subjective gesture, obliterates aura. But this churn also creates millions of new Gothic worlds with each new churn. The ruthless novelty of capitalism can't but create its own object revenge over and over and over. And the cybernetic creates Frankenstein's monster. So critics like Baudrillard are wrong, I'm arguing, in saying that the technological reproduction means a hell of the same, or that infinite reproduction must produce sameness and a permanent eradication of aura and cult value. The reproduced Xerox image eventually becomes abstract and reclaims the unique. The reproduced JPEG is eventually glitched. I believe this is what Andy Warhol tried to show us in the marks of the unique returning in their, uh, their screen prints. The indefinite, the historic center of mediation, meditation, religion, mythology, Islamic abstraction, field painting, and much else is seeming enclosed by the cybernetic. Space is mapped, as are the once vast forests, deserts, and oceans. Everything is known, but in the knowing somehow ceases to be what it had always been. But this is a phantasmagorical being of the bourgeois cybernetic. What appears as naturally artificial is actually an encoding of social relations. So I'm gonna argue that our inability to imagine solidarity with cybernetics, seeing that as a liber the liberatory potential of cybernetics is an extension of our failure to extend solidarity to our working class siblings in general. The cybernetic flow could be entirely different. We could enter and leave at will a consensual flow of infinite subjectivities at various levels of self-determined contact against the positivization, the sort of mapping for commodity of the indefinite, we could enable an anti-capitalist mythologizing that echoes A.V. Lunacharsky's concept of God building, the notion of a free, open, democratic, and anarchic construction of what was considered one time the realm of the spiritual. People on TikTok who live near oceans are posting videos of what they swear are siren songs. This is part of an overall trend on TikTok towards disassociation. There are even disassociation instructional videos on TikTok now. So cyborgs are dreaming. The more passive understandings of the cybernetic flow, like those from Baudrillard, see it as a Gothic flat line. But the Gothic is not flat. The Gothic is a constant reproduction of pathos and trauma. As I argued at HM back in 2018, an aggregate digital communicative capitalism presents us with a totalizing capitalist meta narrative, regardless of the discrete units placed into its flow. Digital social media has become a total installation in which all aspects of uh, life are reframed, in which each unit, symbolically extensions of ourselves, finds itself in negotiation with what I'm going to refer to um, in flair as a hidden bourgeois oversoul, which is encoded in the code of the digital media. As per Jody Dean's contradiction of participation concept, there can be no emancipatory politics without mass communication. 
Yet communicative capitalism undermines emancipatory politics. The cybernetics has a contradictory relationship to the bifurcated subject. On the one hand, easing identity formation and pointing beyond the limits of capitalism, but also threatening subjectivity and enforcing capitalist, racist, and heterosexist norms, um, sometimes at gunpoint or at the threat of losing your job. The internet promises democracy, but delivers reactionary politics and is designed to do so. Um, I think it is important to say whether this was the intention of the people who created it or not. It promises expression and valorization of the subject, but delivers more often dopamine denial and depression. Meanwhile, the analog, at least in the arts, promises authenticity, but fails to deliver much more than rarefied bourgeois spaces out of touch with the vast majority of the human race. As the poet Amira with Baraka would say, they deliver us the fingerprints of rich painters. Or empty art museum spectacles, Epcot Center immersions for the cosmopolitan bourgeois and petty bourgeois. This demands in the arts, I would argue, a digital and analog conflation to weaponize and expose each. While analog and in real life organizing is central to the self-emancipation of the exploited and oppressed, the ideological contest that happens in the digital realm also can't be ignored. But the digital also cannot be, and often too often is, a substitute for in real life organizing. This requires also a response in cultural and political strategy that reckons on this contradiction and develops an alternating approach to the digital and analog. An alternation between auric reproduced images and gestures designed for criticality and the recruitment of expressive human value, particularly the expressive human value of the exploited and oppressed subject. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Adam. And uh, I give the floor to Alexandra Billet. Thanks very much. Let me uh, go ahead and do my screen share real quick. Okay. Share. And I see start. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much uh, once again for uh, being at this panel. Uh, um, and Adam, I think you really helped frame things uh, quite quite well uh, for the rest of this panel. Um, what I'm about to present is uh, very much a work in progress. Um, so I would really enthusiastically welcome any kind of th feedback, um, questions, concerns, disagreements, and things like that, because I'm hoping for this to be in next year's um, Imago journal in print. So it could just as easily come from the outside world, the world outside our window, as it could the screen of our computer. By now, cyberspace and meat space are inextricable, intertwined and mutually dependent. Where just a few decades ago, we could look at the Los Angeles of Blade Runner or the Detroit of RoboCop as cautionary tales, today we see them as simply another version of the present. Likewise, the creepy synthetics of a John Carpenter score that might have once warned us are today a suitable soundtrack for our lives. The sight, the sounds, the smell, the structure of feeling of really existing uneven and combined apocalypse, these are with us right now, staring us in the face. It's been 40 years since the term cyberpunk emerged, uh, not just with the release of Blade Runner, but with uh, William Gibson's Neuromancer and many other writers who uh, were taking influence from Philip K. Dick and, and others. High tech, low life, uh, which has always been a brilliant des descriptor of the genre's aesthetic ethos, uh, is very much in vogue in cinematic, cinematic and gaming culture right now, all these decades later. Augmented human beings dreaming under red carbon choked skies are common fare in film, television, and other media, but also in real life. Some of the highest rated series and films and on streaming services are described as sometimes credibly, uh, sometimes by dint of a stretched meaning as uh, cyberpunk. Now the term synthwave 
uh, is a far more recent arrival to the cultural conversation, uh, but its most ardent practitioners also point to a legacy that more or less starts in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, it's no great revelation to anyone that contemporary culture uh, is very much preoccupied with the 1980s, in particular that decades marvel with technology. Uh, thus, a whole ecosystem of recording artists, uh, both inspiring and inspired by this fascination, uh, have been examining the, the sonic possibilities uh, created by it. Uh, what 10 years ago was a more slippery, diffuse vaporwave aesthetic uh, has kind of been narrowed and consolidated and accelerated into a fairly distinct sound uh, and look and feel. Um, cinematic, epic, it's dripping with synthetic technology. Uh, and there are plenty of artists who are mostly have cult followings that are really excellent practitioners in this, um, uh, in this genre, like Perturbator, Midnight, Power Glove. Uh, but also you can hear the influence of this genre in, in Taylor Swift and The Weeknd too, uh, in, in uh, uh, singles over the past seven or so years. Uh, both cyberpunk and synthwave, I am arguing, in their respective literary, filmic, and musical modes uh, point to the same general feel of a life lived in profound existential peril, uh, where technologies colliding with crisis uh, raise poignant questions about human subjectivity, the kinds of questions that Adam was just uh, investigating. And it's for this reason that I think it's valid to look at both cyberpunk and synthwave as uh, dialectical doubles, if you will. Uh, responding to the same moral, ethical, and uh, aesthetic contradictions and preoccupations that are inherent in late, late capitalism. Um, the tensions between globalization and nationalism, the insinuation of technology into our lives, alienations engendered by them, the gap between the future we were promised and the future that we actually got. Um, and it must be admitted that the future that we got actually looks a lot like what these, what these genres have been trying to warn us about. Uh, going back 40 years. Uh, let's consider what kind of world it is in which the purported miracles of artificial intelligence, for example, and automation obscure the brutal realities of, say, lithium extraction or um, the, the hyper exploitation of, uh, of crowd work, or who are basically the, the people who are being contracted out to make sure that the algorithms keep moving and, uh, um, and what have you. And they tend to be highly concentrated in the global South, uh, moderating our content. Uh, but, and, or think about cryptocurrency, you know, the, the massive amount of carbon that it spews into the atmosphere every year. And now uh, governments like uh, El Salvador and most recently uh, New York City are, are really going out of their way to, to uh, 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 become hubs of this highly unregulated, highly dangerous, uh, ecologically dangerous uh, uh, form of currency. Uh, if these films, books, games, songs that I'm describing in Synthwave, Cyberpunk, um, if they were intended to show us a world of attenuated exploitation and alienation, then it would appear that our moment in which obsolescence is experienced not just by things, but by places and people has caught up with the predictions. Uh, it's easy, I think, for those of us uh, who are sort of predisposed to doomerism, as, and there, there, there's many of us, including some of us in the Locust uh, Arts and Letters Collective, uh, to sort of just really lean into this. Um, plenty of us are always sort of instinctually there. This would be a mistake though, to sort of give up and give in and say that this, that this moment, that the structure of feeling only leads in one direction. Um, for it keeps the understanding of cyberpunk and synthwave very much at surface level and ultimately ahistorical. So what I wanna examine here is what the reification of these genres, of these creative expressions looks like uh, in some contemporary culture and also pose uh, an alternative in which the more reactionary uh, characteristics of them aren't being amplified, but and in fact, some of the, um, some of the uh, more, more progressive and even radical and revolutionary ones. Uh, if we're in need for an avatar of what's wrong with uh, contemporary cyberpunk, 
then we really only need to look at the video game that uh, came out just this past winter. Um, as a reminder, this is a game that was anticipated for the better part of a decade with multiple delays cropping up along the way. Then in December of 2020, when it was finally released, um, all the expectations, the heightened expectations around this game were completely dashed. Uh, stories had already come out that perfect, perfectly fit uh, with uh, what we had already come to know about working conditions, and labor practices in the video game development world. Um, and uh, this played out, I would say, uh, in the actual content and the actual uh, uh, um, execution of the game. Uh, Cyberpunk 2077 definitely has all the shallower markers of a shallow uh, of, a, of a cyberpunk story. Uh, Night City, where it takes place, is highly technologically advanced, but also incredibly stratified by class and inequality. Uh, every conceivable service or so social good has been privatized. Uh, thermonuclear war and a toxifying ecology loom in the not so distant past and all around the all around the city. Um, Night City is. Uh, consummately dystopian uh and of course there, there's in the game there is a an excellent synthwave soundtrack going along with it um but whether this dystopia uh this is one of the criticisms been raised not just by me but by many other people who play this this game um the game's plot sees its protagonist uh attempting to dislodge an implanted ai that's basically going to erase his his uh personality and memories and when you get to the end of the game, he discovers that he can't dislodge it. So he's literally presented with just letting another person take over his personality and subjectivity and being or killing himself. Um, and it's this kind of fatalism that accounts for a real lack of reflection or self-awareness in the game. For example, Night City's police department is entirely privatized. Um, but apart from this being sort of just a cool plot device, it's not really examined what this means. And this is of course happening right as private police forces are starting to crop up all across the United States right now. So without this existence, or without the existence of a, of a critique or an examination of this type of stuff, a lot of players are sort of ended up, ending up looking at things like a privatized brutality, brutal police force and saying, rather than, criticizing it or saying, oh, hey, neat, that's just happening. That's exactly what's happening in, um, in, in real life. It's this kind of bland and cynical technophilia. Uh, as fellow Locust Arts and Letters Collective member Drew Franzblau, who produces uh, um, our podcast and uh, Swarm Stories, um, and is also a gamer, he pointed out to me the most cyberpunk part of Cyberpunk 2077 were the glitches, because that's... Um, uh, the, the gamers encountered thanks to the sort of a, its rushed release. As Franz Blau perceptively pointed out, uh, these accidents, these glimpses into gaps the technology couldn't or hadn't managed to paper over actually forced players to ask questions about the game and, and the world they were entering uh, the developers hadn't intended. Uh, and there's a complementary lack of awareness, I would say, in the way that Synthwave is looked at today. This is a documentary that's worth watching, but incredibly shallow. Rise of the Synths came out a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, the filmmakers do a decent job assembling some of the best artists within the genre. They even get John Carpenter, the director and, and musician, to narrate it because uh, he's regarded as something of a godfather in Synthwave music. Um, and there's a clear acknowledgement that Synthwave's sonic and visual aesthetics are a self-conscious anachronism, right? That they're attempting to straddle both into the past and the future that never quite, uh, never quite came to be. Um, it's as, as Mark Fisher would argue, a uh, hauntological genre. Um, but the commentary on the meaning of this backward looking futurism really doesn't, it, 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 again, it's left very surface level and there's nothing really that, um, asks, you know, what, ask what the meaning behind these, these aesthetics are. Um, there's an, um, a contemporary uh, uh, synthwave artist called, a, or a band called Gunship, and they're uh, a, a, one of many um, really qu quite talented synthwave artists that are um, interviewed during the course of this film. 
Um, and they're asked, okay, why do they look, why do you look to the 1980s for inspiration? And they respond that the, the decade was just simply a more optimistic time. Uh, never mind that the social composition of this optimism uh, was the defeat of the 1960s, the evisceration of unions and other institutions uh, that uh, had given the working class a sense of social cohesion and a sense of, uh, uh, however limited, a sense of, a sense of futurity, of, of purpose and meaning and control. Um, so, and all of those, of course, were just switched out for this yuppie individualism, you know, Reaganism and uh, neoliberalism and everything else that, that we know uh, that really gained, uh, gained steam in the 1980s. Um, and there are many synthwave artists, I should point out, that are very aware of this irony and use that to sort of criticize what's being celebrated by other artists in this embrace of a 1980s sound. Uh, but again, back to Rise of the Synths, it simply didn't appear much in that documentary. Um, what puts this out of step with the potentials of the musical genre is that many of the artistic figures regarded as influential in it um, are actually trying to make this point that there was something very sinister underneath the optimism of the 1980s. Uh, people like John Carpenter, you know, John Carpenter, just for, for a bit of context, you know, he's well known as the director of The Thing and Halloween and many other horror movies. He also composed the music for most of his films. Um, uh, they Live, which actually I just rewatched over Halloween weekend. Um, and he composed most of the music for his films. Um, and he was absolutely trying to warn us that there's something very sinister underneath the optimism. Um, and I would argue, actually, the, the, the synth wave kind of soundtrack accentuates this. It underlines this thematic because it, it sounds sugary sweet, but also un undeniably artificial, right, at the same time. Um, and the films of Carpenter, as well as um, so some of the more recent uh, retro 80s shows, think like Stranger Things, Glow, Cobra Kai, I, I think these are also trying to sort of mind the same instinct of showing that there was something really wrong with the 1980s um, that has brought us to where we're at right now. And that is not necessarily a good thing. Um, so the, the consequence of this, this uncritical outlook that we see in cyberwave and, or, or, or cyberpunk and um, cyberpunk and synthwave um, is, I would say actually incredibly dangerous. It's just one that it's nostalgic and yet technophilic at the same time. And it's one that I would argue is detrimental to any notion of radical human subjectivity. Um, what the more rote forms of nostalgia and more unapologetic forms of technophilia both instill is this static and disempowered subject. Uh, the, the idea that the real agent of the future is a technology that's beyond our reach as human beings. Um, when we find ourselves sort of uncritically pining for a technologized future that never came to be, I would argue we end up playing into the hands of big tech. And again, this overlaps with what Adam said. Uh, it adopts a posture, not unlike what Kate Crawford and Alexander Kampolo um, call enchanted determinism, the, this seemingly contradictory framework shared by most of Silicon Valley, which both accepts this almost magical capability of technology, cybernetics, AI, algorithms, uh, even as this magic is helping impose the same ordered repressive telos um, as human held capitalism. Uh, the catch is of course, because this seemingly magical technology knows better than human reason, it absolves the owners of, of the tech in any responsibility. And of course, this is again, once again, uh, very much in line with what people like Nick Land and the Dark Enlightenment people uh, actually, you know, how they tend to approach uh, technology. Um, in short, the more surface level exhortations of cyberpunk synthwave in our current moment amount to a buttressing of the dictatorship of the present, um, a, uh, a push to accept how the, the depredations of today and the degradations of today as just simply part of what it is. Hence, we wind up with uh, relaxing cyberpunk ambient music. Uh, never mind the fact that cyberpunk and synthwave are supposed to disquiet us to the reality around us. This is using those aesthetics to, to, to 
a calmness to it. Um, however, as I said, th th this isn't all there is to these two aesthetics. And it's here I want to talk about um, a recent uh, article or, or blog post and talk done by uh, Matt Cahoon, uh, who runs the Xeno Gothic blog, where he uh, it's called Salvage Punk and Acid Communism. And he kind of straddles between hauntology, the backward looking Gothic nostalgic um, for uh, and accelerationism, which is the forward looking future oriented, preoccupied with technological progress. And he spans the two using um, a term that should be fairly familiar to many of us here at HM, certainly anyone who, who um, uh, reads China Mieville or Evan Calder Williams or subscribes to Salvage, and that's, uh, salv uh, that, that's Salvage Punk. And he sort of puts forth that this is, um, that Salvage Punk is the sort of missing link between these two, that accelerationism that doesn't keep the oppressed, the, uh, those left behind by history, um, that doesn't have those historical subjects at its center, um, it will end up being insufficient and quite reactionary. And the inverse goes for um, goes for hauntology. If you only end up looking backward, then you just end up freeze frozen in the past. So the, the question really becomes one of historical motion. And uh, so I think that is that needs to be kind of a framework for how we can distinguish what makes more reactionary or problematic, what distinguishes more, more uh, reactionary or problematic expressions of this cyberpunk synth wave uh, aesthetic from the ones that actually are can move forward. Um, and it's it, 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 this is very much in line with what how the surrealists approach uh, subjectivity also, where they put like, it's not just about putting the umbrella and the, the, um, the sewing machine together on the operating table and saying, hey, isn't that neat? It's looking for new meanings that come out of this, this collision of signifiers. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind that William Gibson right here actually considers himself more of a surrealist than a cyberpunk or sci-fi writer. Um, and so I, I would argue that the better, um, that the better examples of these genres are ones that are able to lean into these, the, the aggressively weird, the new subjectivities, the numinous parts of what it means to have our lives be so technologized. Uh, for lack of a better term, the more magical, um, the more magical and, and paranormal um, elements that are drawn up like this, that pull us away from the technophilia and also create a gap through which a new kind of human subjectivity can emerge. And I just want to wrap by uh, talking about um, a way, um, actually talking about a more recent cultural uh, artifact that brings this together in both cyberpunk and synthwave, in both film and music. And that's um, a movie uh, called, um, that's a movie called Blood Machines uh, that came out. Uh, it's on Shutter right now. People can watch it. Um, I don't have time to go into the plot, um, but this is a French short film divided into three parts, written and directed by uh, uh, Raphael Hernandez and Savitri Jolie Gonfard under the collective name of uh, uh, Seth Ickerman um, and scored by Carpenter Brute who I think is one of the most uh, um, uh, uh, talented uh, and just amazing uh, synthwave artists um, working today. Uh, Blood, Blood Machines is by no means a perfect film. The acting leaves a lot to be desired and I reckon there's a worthwhile conversation here about the male gaze, uh, but its feminism though flawed is certainly sincere. Um, and its cyberpunk structure of feeling is one that sort of eagerly looks for something to salvage in the scrap. Uh, though there's no mistaking that the numinosity we're seeing is cosmic in nature in the film. Uh, we're not always sure whether it's scientific or paranormal in nature, or uh, both maybe, you know, with each slipping into each other. Uh, the voices that come out in the score are rarely human, but they seem to have less of a ghost than a soul animating them. Um, in the end, what Blood Machines leaves us with is the insistent that, insistence that new subjectivities require new solidarities. Um, and it's why genres like synthwave and cyberpunk are worth exploring and pushing forward, uh, while their ubiquity does indeed reveal something about how reality has caught up with the most dystopian of art, uh, they also reveal something about the rejection of that reality. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alexander. 
Uh, I'd just like to say to our uh, people uh, watching through the YouTube screen, uh, stream, sorry, that you can uh, put questions or comments in the YouTube chat and we will relay them to the presenters. So please, whenever you think you want to ask something or point to something or comment upon something, just write in the YouTube uh, chat. And I now give the virtual floor to Tister. Okay, uh, so uh, my name is Tish Pearl. I've been casually observing the right off and on for the last 17-ish years. I started on 4chan when I was around 16. I got bored on the paranormal board and decided to, to find other ways to scare myself. Uh, at the time, I was uh, a grumpy atheist and disillusioned with the post 9-11 world that I'd grown up in. And I was almost pulled into right-wing conspiracies via the 9-11 truth movement many, many years ago, which drove me to keep an eye on what I used to think was just like the cesspool at the bottom of the internet. Uh, since summer, I've been closely monitoring how the right is developing on Telegram. Uh, some of the images in this presentation contain material which is upsetting. Given the topic, it's not possible for me to remove everything, but I tried really hard to use content that could trigger only when it was absolutely necessary to show you an honest example of the daily goings on uh, in these gathering places. So pre-putch, the far right operated quietly on the normie web, on the normie web, not silently by any means, uh, but within the confines of the social niceties imposed by Facebook and Twitter. Their echo chambers were also prone to raids and their ideas were met with opposition, obviously from people like us. Um, again, this is not to say that this was an ideal setup or that the right didn't enjoy certain insular safety on the normie web. This is also not to say that no right wingers were using things like Chan boards and Tor or the Onion Router, which is an anonymous open source internet browsing software that you can use to access the dark web. Uh, because of course they were, I, I saw them there, uh, but the structure of things changed significantly after the mass deplatforming. So the deplatforming of the far right was has not decreased to their strength. If anything, being pushed to shadowy, unmoderated corners of the internet was doing them a favor. Uh, the deplatforming after January 6th essentially, essentially created a second far right internet. Uh, my, resource, my research has focused mostly on Telegram, but Gab, the far right version of some ungodly combination of Facebook and Twitter, has a browser dissenter. Um, that creates its own Gab and Dissenter specific comment section visible only to the users of those extension and browser over any website. The, the BBC has had issues posting articles and their own you know, comment sections became disgusting as they do on the internet. Um, and, and Gab had their own over there that, that BBC had requested they remove, but of course they didn't. Um, so QAnon is, a quilt conspiracy, right? Like each new conspiracy is a new patch in the quilt. So shoving these ideologies together into a dark, unfiltered and unmoderated corner has let the anti-Semites and racists throw everything at the wall and let the freshly shunned Trumpists and QAnon believers tell them what sticks. It's working like an ARG, an alternate reality game, where the believers are excavating the truth about what the shadowy elites are doing in this world besides the adrenochrome thing. Uh, between the media matters study on TikTok's algorithm, the nature of the internet being skewed to the right as argued by Jen Schrady, and the fact that many people were willing and ready to fill the sudden demand created by the deplatformed, this has been a boon to right-wing ideology. As content filters down from smaller platforms, what is overt and extreme remains, and what sounds scary ends up on TikTok seemingly removed from the anti-Semitic, anti-Black, or anti-LGBTQ context it originally came from. I have personally had to talk left-leaning friends, comrades, and relatives down from child trafficking uh, conspiracies. I had to explain that these are dog whistles. 
TikTok is in itself a platform full of myth-making from younger people doing everything from dissociating into fictional worlds to pretending, as we saw earlier, mermaids and sirens exist. They're already aware that the world is terrible. Of course, extreme salacious explanations as to why are resonating with them. Uh, you see here the, the, um, the graph from the, the Media Matters study. Related to the study mentioned previously, my partner Adam and I ran a counter study to see if engaging uh, solely with pro-trans content, much of it made by trans creators about the experience of being trans and about trans liberation, if that would affect the algorithm in the opposite fashion. Would we be geared towards right, left-wing content at all? While we assumed that the answer was no, we also sort of assumed that we would get some like LGBT content but actually we were given mostly normie content like heteronormative comedy videos, prank videos, cooking and food videos, some pro cop content, which actually ended up being homophobic. And the one piece of LGBT content that we got was solidly pro US military. Now this is a sharp contrast to starting out your day with transphobia and seeing Nazis by lunch. Uh, obviously, the capability exists to heavily suppress content of a very specific type, that the application is uneven, is as alarming as it is unsurprising. So what is Telegram? Well, Telegram is an app created by Nikolai and Pavel Durov, Pavel being uh, the Mark Zuckerberg of Russia for creating a platform called VK. It's really, it's basically Russian uh, Facebook. It's really soft on white supremacists, overall poorly moderated. Uh, it's not owned by Durov anymore. It was, it was bought by um, Putin sympathetic people. Um, he has been essentially like exiled from Russia. He's, he's living in, uh, I think France right now and Telegram operates out of London and Dubai. Uh, he and Putin are, Durov and Putin are not on good terms. Telegram is now essentially the main myth-making platform for the right, insulated from even the unsatisfying moderation of Twitter and Facebook and the opposition they might find on those platforms. Aunt Karen is now sharing memes about a resurrection bed that heals all of your illnesses and brings you back to life and how it's being hoarded by satanic politicians. And she's sharing those memes with someone who would very much like to tell her that those politicians are in fact working towards white genocide. Channels are aggravating, uh, aggregating conspiracies and what does not spread dies. What spreads is woven into the collective myth. I've read about Hillary Clinton being hung at least three times. I've read Joe Biden is an actor. JFK Jr. is Q and he will be Donald Trump's vice president. Q is Jesus Christ up in heaven on a MacBook. I added the MacBook part, but there are people who literally believe that Q is Jesus. These channels and chats range from, range from just a few hundred people to over 400,000 people. Ron Watkins, the former 8chan admin who was heavily associated with Q, has over 400,000 followers in his chat. Uh, so these are the uh, six layers of, um, of far-right telegram that I have, I have uh, sussed out. They obviously overlap heavily. Uh, the intermingling between these groups happens with content but also with people and cross chat raids. Also other layers exist um, because as I said, Q QAnon operates as a quilt conspiracy. Uh, even if your conspiracy directly contradicts my conspiracy, we'd probably agree on something else. And the shadowy nature of the menacing they means even if you think they're lizard aliens and I think they're Hollywood Satanists, we both know that they're harvesting adrenochrome or something. Uh, so love for Trump has not lasted forever. There are a number of people who have peeled off further into Q and occasionally away from Q entirely and into the welcoming arms of fascists and white supremacists. Still, these are the largest groups, anywhere from 20,000 to about 400,000 people, usually in these groups. I chose these images to show the background noise of widely followed general Trumpist channels. Transphobia, which we've seen exists as a gateway within normie internet algorithms to fascist Nazi content, is here mingling out in the open with anti-Semitism, racism, and memes posing Trump as the savior of the American patriot. And this video you see uh, this of Michelle Obama is a TikTok video. 
these little eye icons on each of these uh, posts shows you that at least 10,000 people have seen these within an hour or two of them being posted. Uh, this, is, this is, as I said, probably the largest category of far-right Telegram users, because when people like Lynn Wood and Michael Flynn and Ron Watkins made Telegram a base for their content and interactions, Trumpists rushed to follow their deplatformed heroes, especially initially to the election fraud channels, which are dwindling, but not, not, not at any, any decent rate. Uh, so uh, the, posts, uh, the posts on this page from, from We the Pepe here on the Evangelical Christian Q, um, this refers to a supposed New World Order project that was supposed to aid in the rule of the Antichrist by projecting false images of demons, conditioning people to self-subjugate. Uh, the general reply to this was that they were happy to know that it wasn't real because their own firm beliefs that Jesus would return made like they think that it was going to look like this. People in the comments under this picture were basically talking about running towards it because they were aware that it was fake. This was an opportunity for them to rise up against the sleeping sheep of America who would have been fooled by this. Evangelical Christian Q hypothesizes that Trump's return to the presidency will begin the time of revelations. Even though many of these people believe that Trump is still secretly the president, they hold that the moment that that goes public as incredibly significant. Until it goes public, things are still moving in the shadows to be uncovered by them. Uh, the two images on the left show the firm link between trusting the plan, trusting God, and trusting Trump. These groups usually have anywhere from 10,000 to 150,000. New Age Q loves Nikola Tesla, energy readings, magnets, auras, crystals, aliens, angels. Groups are usually in the 20,000 to 100,000 range, although mostly under 50,000. Uh, I keep mentioning the blending between the layers because it's an, an important part of how all of these things stick together. Uh, because they're directly contradictory, a lot of them. Evangelical Q does not believe in aliens, but New Age Q believes in angels. So maybe we mean the same thing. Who knows? God is mysterious. At least he led us all here together to defeat Hillary Clinton. Uh, in the middle, we have more anti-vax sentiment from a slightly different perspective. They don't have to agree on why you shouldn't take it, just that it's evil. And on the right, uh, uh, yeah, we see, we see Q being framed as the representation of the Great Awakening. To New Age Q, this means the dawning of a new era or the Great Spiritual Awakening of Mankind or any other number of theories they have about magnets, the Earth, and alien life having seeded life on this planet. Uh, these groups, the Patriot and Proud Boy groups, are usually about 50,000 to 100,000 members. Uh, War Room on the left here is it's sort of like a news aggregation, mostly for like Republican men who use the word rhino as, a, as an actual insult. Uh, it favors Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene and advocates for local involvement in politics and hassling your politicians. This is a, re a recent movement within Q and the right which is why you're seeing a lot of like childless anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers going to school board meetings and yelling about freedom and child trafficking. War Room is an anti-vax uh, uh, channel and it tends towards the COVID is a hoax slash COVID is just the flu thinking. The Western chauvinist uh, is a cesspool of, of Proud Boy and adjacent memes, news and ideology. It's not as far as I know directly linked to any specific Proud Boy groups but it is, it is the, the usual racist, anti-Semitic Proud Boy stuff. The pink image here on the far right is actually from 4chan. I chose that to show that, uh, to represent the link that there is between the Chan dirtbags and, and Western chauvinist Proud Boy ideology. So incels and Chan board dirt bags. Chan channels and chat chats exist on Telegram, mostly as meme, dump, meme dumps and Chan style um, like bro displays of racism. There aren't many dedicated spaces for incels and Chan board dirt bags, but they do exist. Uh, membership ranges from 2,000 to 30,000. 
Mostly these people exist within Nazi, Proud Boy, Patriot, and conspiracy spaces. Nazis are not overly friendly to incel ideology. They are attempting to keep space for and protect white women. I can't find screenshots, but I can attest to seeing men in Nazi chats immediately shut down incels using misogynistic insults and slurs because they have a narrative in place for the moral downfall of Western women, and they don't need it being challenged by incels because it removes women from the victim position, which they heavily rely on. So the first image here on the left uh, is from Based Truth. It's a, it's a way for disseminating propaganda, This particularly this documentary, uh, which is disgusting. Uh, they're usually found, Nazis are usually found strategizing basically about how to peel Trumpists and Q nuts away from these two particular camps. This is getting easier for them as the goalposts keep jumping away, as Trump's not retaken office yet, and since he expressed some, some pro-vaccine feelings. I mentioned before they don't like incels. They are still misogynists, but very specific kind. Uh, and even as they dislike Ghost Ezra, you see here on the right, um, for sharing Q-related memes and conspiracies, they still make space for Ghost Ezra as he shares their anti-Semitism and white supremacism to an audience of people growing more and more ter terrified and disillusioned with their current collection of myths about why everything is terrible and terrifying. Nazi chats splinter frequently. To date, Base Truth is the largest that I've seen at just over 6,000. There are some larger channels, but they're usually dumps for content to direct people to rather than active discussions. So as long as, the, as long as a mass media communication system determined by capitalistic ideology dominates in relation to crises that can't be solved by political center in the context of racism, declining empire, the far right will continue to regroup, recruit, and hone and create the mythology of a 21st century American fascism. Something cohesive is coalescing for these people via things like Telegram and Gab, and also the numerous face-to-face -face conferences that they keep having. Um, these ideas are turning into factions uniting under a common banner. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Tish. Uh, Okay, we have we have like thirty minutes of uh, discussion. Again, anyone from the audience that wants to put uh, a question, please use the YouTube chat to place the questions. Uh, well, okay, and um, until we have the first questions or comments, I would like to pose a question because I was really impressed by Tisha's uh, presentation of this far right, technologically embedded uh, underworld or not so much <laughs> underworld, not. Uh, and I was wondering, this is a question for Adam and Alexander, uh, more Alexander, but also Adam, to what extent this new kind of far right, uh, you know, uh, technocratically embedded uh, networking is reflected in contemporary uh, less or more dystopian artistic uh, representation. To what extent we can find aspects of these dynamics also emerging even, even in, in, in popular culture? Or to what extent uh, the way popular culture is moving in the contemporary context is also even, even uh, unknowingly uh, uh, affected by these, uh, these dynamics? This is my question. Yeah, um, that, that's a really good question, actually. I, I, I really, um, so for example, there is a fascist uh, wing of synthwave music. It's um, called Fashwave. Um, and it, it sort of nebulously sits somewhere between in terms of how it sounds, it's somewhere between vaporwave and synthwave, but, um, and it is, you know, it sounds like synthwave music uh, and it sounds, you know, but it's politics are, you know, obviously very, very far right and everything else that we would expect from a genre called fashwave. Uh, I'd, I'd also argue it's actually musically a, 
less interesting because it doesn't get the irony of um of some of the like the, the layer of irony that should be allowing us to experience synthwave or cyberpunk as a critique is completely missing from fashwave um because like i said a lot of them look at this sort of highly atomized technologized society um, in the same basic way that Nick Land and the neo-reactionaries in the Dark Enlightenment look at it as just this is an opportunity for us to become um, a select few of us, of course, to become, you know, the, use technology to repress the rest. Um, now, how much of that shows up in popular culture? I don't know. I, I think that there's a gradation there. I, I think that it you could argue it's always been there um in some of the popular um expressions of synthwave and, and and cyberpunk uh but it's always been there just like the the sort of more left-wing impulses and instincts have been there so really i think the difference is right now we're at a point where the globe could tip one way or the other and what was sort of an uneasy ideological tension could spill easily one way or the other and uh, into um, um, the more right wing uh, versions of it, uh, you know, like I, it, it, so I don't think necessarily, at least when I watch like most cyberpunk or, or, or um, listen to synthwave, it's not like I hear them, uh, I, not like I hear Nazis like sort of worming their way into popular culture. I actually think it's kind of the opposite. I think that the more reactionary um, sides of these genres are what Nazis are seizing on to in order to create sort of a subculture. But as Tish shows, that subculture can very easily sort of push its way out and find its way to insinuate. I think that's the part that we're at in the process, at least considering these two subgenres. Thanks, Alexander. I, I, I can pivot off that a little bit. I think that, um, and this is related to something Alex really talked about um, in their presentation, <clears throat> you know, something that might be uh, cultural in terms of story and aesthetics and so on, a cultural warning in 1978, a, a critical uh, left-wing warning can become bourgeois apologetics in 2020 or 2021 or whatever. So Romero's Dawn of the Dead, right? Versus uh, 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 the TV show, The Walking Dead. Um, or so on, or specifically from Alex's talk that, you know, related to it, <clears throat> the privatization of the police department in the original RoboCop movie being clearly this dystopian nightmare, contradictory politics about the police and so on, of course, but it's this dystopian warning and satire, but in a current video game, it's just a neat little detail. And I think that this is related to um, something that Tish talked about in terms of like the TikTok algorithm, right? Like it appears as natural, right? Naturally artificial, but this is the phenomenon, this is the uh, phantasmagoria of, of this digital media. It's actually coded, it's an embedding of, of bourgeois ideology. So it all appears normal, right? It's mostly really stupid humor, dance videos, pets, cooking videos. Some of it's better than others. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not. <clears throat> but if you look at transphobic videos, within a few hours, you're introduced to fascism or fascist videos. But if you look at material created by trans creators and pro-trans material, it doesn't even introduce you to other LGBTQ material. The normal web naturalizes fascism in a way while making unnatural communism and so on. So I think this is related to um, uh, Benjamin. Um, the, the internet asceticizes politics uh, for the most part. There's exceptions to that. There's all sorts of contradictions to that. I think it is important to say that it isn't the case that the auric cult value of an image equals asceticizing politics. Um, but this asceticizing of politics that happens in digital media and in the reification of things that were critiques of capitalism and racism and so on over time, where a critique of capitalism becomes a neat little detail, and I think is related to this process by which uh, far right things are, are spreading. 
in a way that far left things do not spread, despite the original utopian celebrations uh, amongst like not radical leftists, but the Habermas like liberal Democrat types um, about the possibility of the Internet. Thanks, I mean, like, Okay, taste. Do you want to counter? Uh, uh, I was just gonna say, like it, like I said in, in in my presentation, like the the stuff that the stuff that you can't tell is evil. That's the stuff that goes the farthest, right? So, like, there's there it, it probably has been filtering into popular media for a long time because we wouldn't necessarily know, right? Unless we actively studied where something. Okay, we have a question from the from the audience, uh, and the question is: Any comments on Facebook's an ironic attempt to realize the concept of the metaverse? Sorry, who wants to uh, take a stand on this? Okay. Uh, well, I, I I see a non-verbal, very negative uh, reaction. <laughs> um, I I I could throw myself out there. I, I, uh, only because I um I had to skip over it kind of briefly, uh, um, in my talk because I was running over time. But I I mentioned when I wrote it originally, um, the metaverse is absolutely the extension of everything or well we'll see but i think from what we've seen so far of the behavior of mark zuckerberg facebook everything we've come to find out about its amplifying of far right um far right content and it, it's it's shoddy moderation of that um i think that this uh the, yeah the, there's it, it to me the metaverse is peak cyberpunk um, but peak capitalist realist cyberpunk. Um, the idea of being able to sort of simulate, uh, you know, a card game and things like that. I mean, it's this is the kind of stuff that was in the Lawnmower Man 30 years ago. Um, you know, it, it, it feels really, um, it feels like one more step in all of this, although a really, really... Um, uh, important step in sort of, as Adam was saying, the aestheticization of politics, the aestheticization of human interaction. Um, you know the the way that uh, Guy Debord talks about the way that it's 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 not actually you know th this is social relation being further entrenched into a representation um, and a commodification, a commoditized representation. Um, and I think that it does not bode well uh, for what we. Uh, <laughs> for the future of how we would, you know, it, it, if, if we want to long for and fight for, as I argue we should, like a more democratic internet, a more democratic model for technology and internet and making social media more social and less media, less mediation than, I mean, the metaverse is uh, not exactly, um, not exactly, uh, doesn't exactly bode well, as I said. Um, though my, it still could also fall on its ass. Particularly because uh, young people are running away from Facebook in droves right now. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll shut up there. Anyone else wants to comment but on this? They could have called it the metadataverse. I mean, that's what Facebook's business model really is, right? It's a collection of large amounts of data to target. Um, and definitely people are running away from Facebook here. Although in some, some parts of the world, Facebook is the internet, basically, for some areas. Um, and then, of course, there's Instagram, and I think does Facebook own WhatsApp now. There's some tension there because, of course, WhatsApp is a, mostly a messaging device, so it's actually harder to monetize in the same way in terms of information extraction. So, <clears throat> but they have some things to work with. But I think what is very telling is you have this corporation that, on the one hand, uh, has just been exposed for, from a bourgeois point of view, damaging democracy. Um, and putting their private business interests above uh, all else, announcing that they want to create a virtual universe in which their CEO or whatever is God. Uh, 
and that that isn't seen as absurd. It's right along there with Elon Musk and uh, Bezos trying to turn Mars into the Cape of Good Hope or whatever for a 21st century space imperialism. It's absurd at one level, but also because it's taken seriously, because all things with money are to be taken seriously, I'm paraphrasing Marx, regardless of how banal or stupid they are, um, it has to be taken seriously uh, uh, by, by us. I do want to say I made a mistake in my slides. I attributed a slide from the acid left to Adam Ray Aikens, and it was actually from Mike Watson, and I wanted to apologize. Thanks a lot, Adam. Uh, okay. Well, we have a question from the from the audience, which I suppose is also an idea, uh, uh, sorry, a way for you to also, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, offer uh, your conclusions or how do you think things should go on from from now onwards. The question is from Laura Fersult, and it is any ideas of how the left should fight these things also touching on the concept of socialist irrealism. So uh, who wants to go first on this? This? I have a small idea about how we could go about fighting some of the things on the right. And that's maybe to, in some ways, take a page or two from their book, the particularly the fact that they don't need to agree on all of the teeny tiny little details about a thing, as long as they know that they're trying to get to the same destination, they are more than willing to, well, we'll fight that out later. That's an important thing, I think. Um, I also uh, I also think that, um, I mean, we have to keep, they're making myths. The only way to counter their myths is to make our own myths, right? Like that's, those are really the two the two things that I have for that. Thanks. And before I give before I give the floor to Adam and Alexander, there's a there's an extra question for for you from Holly Lewis. Hi, Holly, uh, who's been really enthusiastic, I have to say, during the uh, the presentation, clapping virtually clapping hands after each presentation. <laughs> So the question is, can Tish explain how this new hidden site like Gab and Telegram, I suppose, not Telegraph. <laughs> Telegraph used to be a very old uh, <clears throat> uh, messaging <coughs> instrument, are different than the chance in terms of structure. Right, so, so Gab is sort of, uh, Gab is a lot like a mixture of Facebook and Twitter and it, it runs sort of, I mean, it looks more like Twitter than anything else. Um, and it's not, it's not anonymous. Uh, you have to register, you have to give a phone number and, and register. Telegram is a little bit more anonymous, but you also still have to give a phone number. Obviously you can get around that with some of the various apps that let you buy a telephone number for a short amount of time. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, the chans also like you, you're gonna have a hard time um, hacking a chan and getting information on the people that posted because they just don't keep that information. Whereas things like Gab and, and Telegram, they do. And we have seen that time and time again because of people hacking them and outing all of the users. Um, I, I can't obviously for legal reasons support such things, but you know, good job. Uh, Alexander, Adam on the more general question uh, originally posed. Adam, why don't you go ahead? All right, so I saw that there was uh, also a question that I wrote down some notes in response to about uh, generational differences, um, um, about like how people approach this stuff. And it made me think of like some of the differences in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the pattern of the way this technology moves through culture constantly making things anachronistic that Alex talked about, which parallels how capitalism is constantly making us anachronistic in terms of our labor and making us precarious, which of course Benjamin observed in his essay on the work on, on mechanical, uh, in his age of mechanical reproducibility, the image for the artwork in the age of mechanical reproducibility. And it's the new image 
can be either critical or reactionary. And the auric image, the one with cult value, can be either critical or reactionary or in between or whatever. And there's constant innovation and novelty that is constantly, on the one hand, destroying the quote unquote aura of an image or the value associated with it or individual expression, but also then recreating it as that constant novelty and innovation moves moves forward. And I think this is related to what we've talked about and other people have talked about is a Gothic futurist nature and time or history uh, for the exploiting and oppressed subject where the past is both victories and defeat. And of course we said the future is both promise and threat. Um, so one of the things that happens with the reactionary stuff is this reactionary idealization as Alex said with the 1980s and so on. But you can also dig up, you know, revolutionary images from the 1970s and, and so on. You can have a technological future that's fully automated luxury gay space communism. And you can have an automated future that is a fascist fucking nightmare, right? So I think in terms of how that plays out with individuals is partly generational. Um, and so on in terms of what do they personally resonate with because of how they've moved through this pattern of constant innovation and trauma um, uh, because that innovation is not emancipatory for us, even though it has the potential potential for it. And so I think we have to shift and pivot um, with political as well as aesthetic strategy, strategies based on that. Um, I think in terms of practical politics, in terms of countering this, I think what Tish has, has said is really important. Um, the There's lots of sectarian fighting on the far right, but at the end of the day, they all agree that they're a bunch of racist shits and they're united around that goal. They're a fundamentally reactionary petty bourgeois goal that will enable a more vicious utilitarian capitalism. We're too sectarian and we're too passive. Um, whether we're passive because we're waiting for the next election or we're passive because we're recruiting somebody to a ridiculously high level of theoretical agreement to a Leninist cult, sect, or whatever, we're too passive. Uh, rather than organizing campaigns as much as we can in the here and now, being with the working class, being with the oppressed, organizing with them on a daily basis in order to achieve things and grow our side on the practical side. Part of that requires a digital strategy because we can't we can't concede this communicative space to the right and to the mainstream, but we have to understand it's stacked against us. And a digital strategy there will only break through if we have an IRL strategy, an analog strategy that builds the numbers and the forces and so on that can break through. In terms of cultural work, in terms of making art and literature, poetry, films, and so on, I just is also absolutely right. We need a counter mythology, a counter mythology to both the mainstream capitalist realist, neoliberal bourgeois mythology, as well as this growing far right exterminist fascist um, mythology. And our mythology has to be fundamentally different than both of those others because both of those others are commandist and come from the top down, or in the case of the far right, they want to reestablish a new top down um, with new people at the top uh, directing things. And what we want to do is overcome that completely. Um, the, one of the things that we talked to uh, uh, comrade Adam Ray Aikens about was uh, the question of could the left have an ARG like QAnon? And one of the things we discussed is probably not in this sense, because Q is a single voice and the multitude that follows Q is in there are subordinated to it. And what we want is the subordination of the bourgeoisie and the fascists to the multitude. So our mythology has to be varied, contradictory, evolving, and so on. It has to be that true consensual flow, the, po the po radical potential of the cybernetic that is denied because for some fucking reason, we've created a communicative capitalism that interfaces with our subjectivity at an unprecedented level that is controlled by somebody who created an app to rate how women looked when he was in college. This person shouldn't be even allowed in polite conversation, let alone have control over something like that. But that's capitalism. Alexander? I don't have much to add to that uh, other than um, just building off of what Tish and Adam have both said about the need for us to um, have a counter mythology. Um, I think, you know, that's what Locust exists for in order to sort of re 
reignite a, a radical fantasticism, a radical imagination that is able to, to really burst through the limitations of capitalist realism. Um, and uh, th this goes to what, what uh, Laura was asking also about socialist irrealism and critical irrealism. Um, when you look, and, and I think specifically what that has to do with technology is really is is really fascinating. You you look at go back a hundred years to when the left was far bigger, far more influential. Had actually, you know, was was full of people who who had lived through and helped fight in revolutions. Um, they had a, you know, this this includes people like, like Gramsci, who was it's uh, it still debated quite a bit. Uh, you know, a, a celebrant of Fordism. Of the assembly line, but not because it atomized people, but because it might have, might it also has the potential to free up time to to make labor a bit easier and things like that. And he, he identified the the kernel of that possibility within it, despite the fact that it it was you know it, it is the pattern of atomization um, on, under capitalism, um, or was the dominant pattern of atomization under capitalism for almost a hundred years. And so that's why you get things like uh, Owen Hatherley's book, uh, The Chaplin Machine, you know, like when he goes through the way that Charlie Chaplin was was revered in the Soviet Union, because there was this imaginary being played with of what would it be like if we could use technology, if, if technological advances were actually just extensions of our most egalitarian and democratic instincts. You know, that's a utopian imaginary and a utopian instinct that I think has always been part of us, part of our side when we are at our largest and most influential. That's not a coincidence because people are attracted to that. People fundamentally want meaning and control in their lives. And when we're able to show ways in which it could actually, not in ways it could be true, but which ways in which it could become true, how we get from where we are now to there, while not being dishonest, while not skating over the difficulties, while admitting we are in a moment of salvage, if we can do that, I, I, then I, I, I think that that's exactly what the radical imagination is there for. And we need to really nurture that as much as we can. Thanks a lot. Uh, yep, we have a, a comment from Holly Lewis saves the meta of social non-production, which I think it's a nice phrase, really, really well put. And I think that uh, unless uh, uh, Tiff, Alexander or Adam want to add something to their uh, formidable uh, presentations and interventions, which uh, at least uh, showed us that even though we're already in the post-apocalyptic, we can still think human emancipation and uh, we can have the radical imagination of human emancipation as the post post apocalyptic. And I would like to really, really thank them for the work they do, not only for the panel, the work of Locus, the work of Imago. And uh, many thanks also to anyone who attended. Thanks for the comments, thanks for the questions. And please continue to virtually attend. Uh, HM online. Uh, there are still like I think uh, nine more days of exciting Marxist debate and conversation. So please continue to uh, to attend, continue to support the HM project, subscribe, buy the books. Uh, yeah, and keep on struggling. We really need it. So okay, again, many many thanks.